Hey everyone, welcome back again to Sanctuary Church Online. My name is Andrew, pastor here at the church and uh, excited to be with you. Uh, it is week four of Advent and before I jump into the message, uh, I wanted to just again draw your attention to adventoffering.org. Uh, uh, this is our big initiative that we do every year along with our vision fund where we look at some key strategic um, mission and in-house initiatives and we... Um, just take, uh, take seriously the privilege that it is to be generous as a church. So if you haven't yet, please go to that um, and just decide with you, with your family, um, how you might participate with what God's doing in our church. So again, week four of Advent. Uh, Advent, if you're just, just joining us, you're not familiar with this word. I didn't grow up with this word, uh, but this is this four-week season that's leading up to Christmas where we remember one of the greatest moments in all of history a moment that caused our calendars even to be reworked, right? This is the birth of Jesus. No one, no one has had the sort of impact that Jesus has had on the world. Even if you were uh, to reject, which many do, the supernatural claims surrounding him, the religiosity surrounding him, you would not find another figure in human history that has had this level of impact in every field of study and people group and social movement. It is absolutely remarkable if you just step back from it for a minute. So that's why the season is a big deal. Now, one key character in the Christmas story that we're gonna talk about today is John the Baptist. He and Jesus actually have this in utero moment together, sort of. Mary, the mother of Jesus, and John's mom, Elizabeth, stay with each other while pregnant. And there's this scene where Elizabeth um, feels John in some way sort of like leap in her womb when the pregnant Mary first arrives at her house. I don't know if any of you have like lifelong friends. I have this lifelong friend. To this day, we're best mates. Uh, and I have a picture, we both have these pictures of our moms together and pregnant with each of us. John the Baptist is right there with Jesus at the beginning. Now we're told that John the Baptist has this incredibly important call on his life. So I wanna look at two passages uh, in the book of Luke. So before this in utero moment that I just mentioned, we have Luke chapter one. So if you'd turn with me there. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah and his wife, Elizabeth. They were uh, childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as a priest before God, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. When Zechariah saw the angel, he was startled and was gripped with fear. This seems to happen. All right, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people, and hear this last phrase, prepared for the Lord. This is the calling on John the Baptist's Life. This is the, the other miraculous birth that happens in the Christmas story. John the Baptist's life has this calling to prepare the way for Jesus. Now, fast forward a little bit, and we see this again a little further on in Luke at the beginning of John's ministry. Read with me here. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet, a voice, John is a voice of one calling in the wilderness. And again, we see these words, prepare the way for the Lord. A couple questions for us before we begin. Why does Jesus need someone to prepare people for him? Did Jesus really need an opening band? <laughs> Do we still need to be prepared like now, given that Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, does continue to come to us in our lives. Let's pray together. Lord, with Christmas now fast approaching, 
For some of us, this being an incredibly joy-filled season. For some of us, uh, this is a moment of, of, uh, of anguish and hardship and, and darkness, uh, even without this pandemic hanging over us. For many, uh, this Christmas has been just wildly disrupted. Uh, we are here now together, sitting at your feet in some mysterious way, opening your word together, doing what the church has done for centuries, gathering around to worship and to hear the word with an expectancy that you would speak, that you would challenge, that you would convict, that you would encourage, encourage, that you would admonish. And so we pray, Lord, as we often do, open our eyes that we would see you, open our ears that we would hear you, Open our hearts this morning. Lord, th this word that I'm going to give and exploring in the scriptures, Lord, it's only as powerful in some ways as we allow it to be. So help us, Lord, to open ourselves up to faith this morning. I pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Preparation. Preparation. I remember... This moment, I believe I've told this story before, but it, it stands out as one of the more um, just hilarious stories in my family history. So my wife, many of you know my wife, Corey, she is the prepared one. She is the one who um, just has stuff set up when it comes to whether it's our finances or heading off on a trip or getting the house stuff ready. She's just like on it which is why this story stands out. We were planning, uh, we have this a wonderful gift from her family of this sort of regular annual vacation. And so we were preparing for this vacation. At the time we had um, our firstborn, I think was maybe four, three or four. And, uh, and then we had a, a newborn with us and we were gonna make the trip, uh, get on the plane, head to the vacation with our newborn. And I can't remember now if, she thought she had read something that said that the newborn didn't need a passport or just had missed it or overlooked it. And it's easy for me, right, to kind of pass the book onto her, but she's the, she's the one who prepares. So, you know, I have other good qualities. And, uh, <laughs> and so we get to the airport. We are ready to go. Um, our nuclear family is there. Corey's family is there. We, uh, we've got, like, we're checking all the luggage. We're checking in. We're there early. We're ready to fly out. And uh, it gets to checking in uh, Rowan, my second born, and uh, we come to, to quickly realize that our child does need a passport for where we were going for our vacation. The look on everyone's face, you can imagine what that was, and especially Corey. She just was absolutely um, taken aback by the fact that she had not prepared well. And so anyway, the story goes, I, I, um, I ended up taking Rowan and we went back and we found a way to get a passport in 24 hours and went to Boston. And, you know, I was pretty bummed out, you know, but I was, I was, I was just loving the family. You go, you go, honey. Um, and anyone who's ever done that, no, no, you go, I'll, I'll take the brunt, you know, on the other side, as soon as I actually got to that location, um, I was, I was, you know, showered with love and gifts and space and time, but it was, it was like one of these crazy moments where you're like in the, we're in the airport going, oh my gosh, I might not be able to get there at all. That was pretty much our assumption before we realized there was a long shot way of us getting a passport really quickly. The season of Advent is all about this idea of preparation. We go back in time to remember that moment in history when the light came into the world, when God, when the divine, the logic, the spirituality behind everything made itself known to us in flesh and blood as a baby born in dirt and straw. We remember what it was like for this Jewish people and Gentiles in the first century to prepare their hearts for the coming light, for the coming savior. This is Advent. And so traditionally the church during the season then has also re remembered, recalled, used this as a moment to look at how Jesus continues to come to us today through the Holy Spirit to ask like, how do we prepare the way? How do we prepare our hearts and lives that we might follow uh, him and hear his voice? 
Also, Advent is a season traditionally where we're looking to the future and asking how do we prepare ourselves for this final coming where Jesus will ultimately make all things new, what Jesus calls the reconciliation of all things, what Paul calls the renewal of all things. It's the mountaintop that Dr. King so famously describes. It's a season of preparation. So a few questions again for us is, how does John tell us to prepare for the coming king, for the coming hope, for the coming joy, for the coming love, for the coming peace? And then there is the question behind that one. Why do we need to prepare? So first, a little bit of background. Bear with me for a moment. Some flashbacks to history class. In Eastern countries, when a monarch um, wanted to pay a visit to a distant part of, of his or her dominion, they were uh, accustomed to send messengers before them to invite or demand of the inhabitants of every part of that kingdom that they are coming through and they need to make the road easy by filling valleys and cutting through hills. It was customary actually for Hindu kings when on journeys to send a certain class of the people like two or three days before them to command everybody to clear the way, literally like make sure the roads are clear and then to go and be sort of heralds to give people a heads up. You don't wanna miss who's coming in to town. Same idea here. John, like prophets before him, is just here to say, get ready but for a very different kind of king and a very different kind of kingdom. A little more context. Rome at this time uh, ruled this area uh, that the Christmas story takes place in where Jesus spends all of his time uh, for about 100 years. Uh, Caesar Augustus, the first emperor, uh, had died in AD 14. In his place, uh, the ruthless Tiberius had taken his place. Um, he was already sort of being worshipped as a god in the eastern parts of the empire. Herod, who was this local puppet king, was absolutely brutal. He had two sons who were ruling, who were a bit of a joke. They were in the northern part of the country. Um, there was a number of resistant movements that had happened, that had come and gone. Uh, in some cases, there's brutal stories of these resistant movements having been horrifically put down, uh, horrible stories of, of around crucifixion and, and just a bloodbath that took place and the revolts that would, would uh, happened that are well-documented. Everybody knew there was this cultural angst. Scholars and historians have been writing about this for years. There was this sense that you couldn't, we couldn't go on anymore. If you were there, a, a, a Jewish person who had been occupied, we can't keep going on like this. Something had to happen. Now, the devout Jews that were living under this occupation had longed for something from God. It had seemed God was silent. There were no prophets for hundreds of years. Um, but there were many who were hoping and expecting that God would do what he had done many times before and bring Israel out of slavery into new freedom. The old prophets had spoken about a time of renewal where God would come back to them. Um, and so to, to, to say all this in that culture was, uh, the culture was primed, primed for John. John is this fiery prophet who's drawing huge crowds out of the city, out of Jerusalem. He's baptizing them in the Jordan, which was this powerful sign of renewal. It's a whole other sermon. Now, since the old prophets had declared that this slavery that they were in, this oppression that they were in, was the result of their nation's sin, of worshiping idols rather than the one true God, of not caring for the poor and oppressed, um, that when a new freedom movement happened, it would have to deal with all of this sin. The way to escape this occupation, the way to escape this sort of slavery, the, the prophet said, was to return. Return to God with heart and soul, to trust God again, to be ready. Another word for this that is used by John that we're going to get into is this word repentance. So we have John being set up in the Christmas story and in the beginning of his ministry to do what the prophet Isaiah had said, prepare a pathway for the Lord himself to return to his people. This was the time. Rescue and freedom and life were knocking at the door. But the people, as we read throughout Jesus's ministry, were not in good shape. Now, I love this part of the Christmas story. 
I love this word of, re, of uh, repentance and preparation. It's like this reminder that these people needed to be prepared for the coming king. I love this because it's not just their story. This is our story. Without preparation, we aren't ready. By failing to prepare, we're actually, um, I don't know, preparing to fail. I've talked about my Sabbath before. Uh, we do Sabbath, it's about like 24 to 36 hours. It starts on Friday at dinner time, and it goes like through church. We sort of like symbolically end it with heading to church on Sunday. Sabbath is, uh, it's become this beautiful thing. I just found out that on Fridays, my seven-year-old loves to talk to her friends and like almost as a sort of like pride, be like, yeah, we got Sabbath tonight and then shares with them all that we do. So we light some candles and they have some symbols attached to it and we make pizza together and make a meal. We put our phones in a box. We try to tune out, make sure everything is done. But the thing that makes Sabbath and has made Sabbath come alive over the last year has been us ramping up our preparation, making decisions about what we're gonna do and not do. It's not just about stopping to work, but turning away, pushing it out of my mind, putting, pushing it out of my wife's mind and out of our heart. It's making space so that I can uh, receive and I can see in preparing to have free mental space for my kids. That's what I'm doing. I'm preparing to see things I don't usually see given the current pace of my life. I'm preparing to uh, notice things in my heart. Corey and I would give each other a couple hours like, to ourselves on Saturday. I'm trying to prepare on that Friday night after we put the kids down to listen to my wife in a more intentional way. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make space so God can come and be with me. I prepare because I don't want to miss the Christ who has come, the Christ who is coming, and the Christ who will come again. This is a discipline. It's a way of life that we have to take seriously. There is a preparation for good things, and then they're right, there's a kind of preparation for God things, for being able to see the bigger reality. Have you ever had an appointment um, or like, like someone was coming to pick you up uh, and you just weren't ready. I was just talking to a buddy of mine literally seconds ago. <laughs> I was trying to remember a story because I think it's happened so many times where someone was coming to pick me up and I just wasn't ready or I, <laughs> I was slept in. I needed a knock on the door. I needed someone to actually like go find my spare key and come in because we were going to be late for the thing. The amount of time, like, oh, the bags aren't quite packed. We're not quite prepared. I, I imagined um, the knocking on the door. And I have found that God comes knocking regularly. It says in Revelation 3.20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. I think God comes knocking all the time. We've actually shared a lot on that, a lot of home churches on that and Bible studies on that and preached a lot of sermons on that. God, God comes knocking all the time. We have, these, we have these dreams in our heart that God has given us for the future. We have visions of what it might look like uh, to, 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 to pursue love and grace and mercy and freedom in the future. God giving us these invitations saying, come. I think a lot of us are thinking uh, a lot about 2021 right now right? This is going to be my year. Well, I would just ask if you prepared for it. If you don't prepare for it, it won't be. It's the old adage like, yeah, as soon as January 1st comes around, I'm going back to the gym. If you can't start going to the gym now, I swear to you, it's not going to work out when you get to January 1st, right? We've talked so much. I was, I was scanning back through the messages we've given since quarantine. So many of them have come back to, did I turn aside? that I take advantage of this like Kairos moment? Am I looking at this really difficult situation and seeing what God might be teaching me in it? Did I see this moment here and now? Did I take, a, did I take um, account for the things that I was being called to change? Did I allow this moment to reveal the sin in my life? To see things that, I, I, that need to move? To see places where I need to wake up? Because tomorrow's coming and God will continue 
to be not, will continue to knock. And so how, how do we prepare? How do we prepare? How are we ready to go and answer the door, to even hear the knocking at the door? John is out here preparing the people for Jesus to come by telling them to repent. And if you keep reading, John wasn't going to be satisfied with a few like outward rituals, like some like religious church language where you could just still hide your real self. I repented today in church. There's a difference between saying that you're ready and actually preparing. Repent, repent. This is still, this is still how we prepare for God to come into our lives and come into the details of our lives, come into our circumstances. Repentance is about turning, turning away, turning back, changing direction, getting a new perspective. It has this idea of giving up your agenda and taking up a new one. It's about turning away from patterns of life that deface and distort who you and I were created to be. Most often when we talk about repentance, uh, we talk about this turning away, turning away from our sin, which without question is one critical way to understand it. But there is another side. Many writers in the Christian tradition have talked about repentance as turning toward. We can turn away from habits and behaviors and patterns and dispositions that are unhealthy, but the power, the ability to sustain that turning away is all about what or who we are turning towards. Our hope lies in turning toward God. You could say it another way, turning toward reality, turning toward truth. We still are turning away in that moment from the things that keep us from love. But we aren't leaving a vacuum. The sin isn't driving the turning. Perfect love and beauty is. It's not just the fear of this sin, it's the love and compelling beauty. That's where the life is. That's the best possible way to live. And so we have to prepare the way. We must prepare God's path to our hearts to cultivate an awareness of how near God is, of how immediately he accompanies our every moment, how beautifully he attends to our breath. And we do this by allowing his perfect love to be there and to be the thing that turns our head and makes space in our hearts for that love and hope and joy to continue to come. It's the looking into the face of perfect forgiveness, knowing that when we turn, knowing that when we turn from that brokenness, we turn from that ache and we turn from that pain, God is there to meet us with open arms. If your heart, right, is crowded with idolatry, if your heart's crowded with cynicism, if your heart's crowded with misalignment, like my house often is right before, you know, Sabbath, like th there's no room for God. There's no room for God. All spiritual growth begins with turning away from whatever is hindering our obedience. We need to trust in then the God of the universe. Prepare the way, prepare the way, be ready. See, Advent, Advent can be more than just a four-week season. Advent can be a way of life. Because if you stay ready, you won't have to get ready. If you cultivate a life of preparation, a life of constantly turning to God, of lifting your eyes off lesser loves, off our sin and off our ego and onto God, there's always room. God's always with us, singing over us in love, ready to heal ready to give you a new dream, ready to use you. He is knocking at the door. And some of you aren't ready to go. You don't even hear the knocking. You haven't turned towards him. So you're in danger of missing the freedom and beauty in life that's yours in Christ. You know, one big reason we can often miss God is because actually, because God is love. You think, how honest did I miss God? Well, well, by nature, love will not force itself upon the other. Love, love says, I, I'm here, and love waits to be invited in. This, in part, is why we must prepare for the coming of God. 
over and over and over again. We must lay our plans down. We must shape all of our, all of our affairs for the coming joy and hope and love. Because these things are at their height when we have prepared well. How do you need to prepare your heart for the coming King? Remember, as we close, go back to that first verse, Luke 1, 16. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord to turn the hearts of the people, uh, sorry, turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. If John were to come down your street today, with a megaphone, what would he be saying? What would rise to the surface in your heart? As you heard him say, turn around for real this time. Turn towards God, turn away from what hinders you. Prepare your heart for love is coming to knock on the door. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. So before we close, uh, I asked Jen if she would uh, sing the song. It's not a traditional Advent or Christmas song, um, but it's this really simple prayer called, Lord, I need you. And so I wanna invite you just to sit with all of this for a moment as she sings. And, and so um, when we're done with the song, we're gonna come back um, and kind of pivot to the close of Church Online today. So let's just take a moment to reflect. This is sort of our come to the altar moment. And then I'll be back. <laughs> 